16 years I've traveled with this one film. I'm 41 years old, more than significant part of my adult life. Uh, there's been just one constant and that is this film. You should see photographs of Blessy from the first day of shoot of RDG with them and now. They look like father and son. Blessy today looks like Santa Claus. I don't quite recollect how long it was. I remember the cameraman slowly whispering. <laughs> Can I cut? You know, so, so then I had forgotten that I was supposed to say, yeah, it's, it's done. Why is there a sudden spike in interest in the goat life from the next big Malayalam release? I owe that to Manyamil Boys, to Premalu, to Brahma Yugam. I know their success could potentially pave the way for my success. with an apology though. Uh, Blessy sir is not going to be able to come because there's some last minute technical work on the film that he's caught up with. But we have in the house the wonderful Prithviraj Sukumar. Love you too. So, Prithviraj, let's let's talk about the goat life. Adu Jivitam, am I saying it correctly? Yes. Yes, yes you are. Yeah. So, this is of course a survival drama based on a best-selling novel, which in itself is based on a true life story. Yeah. And we'll get to that later, but here's what I'm fascinated with. This is a story that celebrates the resilience of the human spirit. Yes. And the making of the film <laughs> also became a testament yeah. to the resilience of the human spirit. Yes. Yeah, so here's what I've read that you and Blessy sir decided in 2008 that yeah. you were doing this. 2009. Early, 2009. Yeah. Yeah. Shoot starts nine years later in yes. 2018. Yeah. And now in 2024, this film is finally releasing. Yeah. What does it take to stay in love with a project for 14 years? <sighs> to be frank, when we started out, we were not anticipating a 16 year long journey. Mm. I have to be honest, we always knew it was going to take a bit of time because even back in 2009 when Blessy first uh, approached me and told me his vision behind the film, it was always a very big canvas that he had envisioned for the story to be narrated against. And back in 2009, it was pretty much impossible to be pulling something like this off from Malayalam. Uh, and I've I've told Blessy multiple times in the early days of our association that maybe you should take it to another actor and try and do it in another language because uh, he always had this really big vision for the film. And I think in between he, he gave it a thought of uh, you know maybe doing it as a Tamil film or getting a, a Tamil or a Telugu actor. So that the budget gets bigger? Exactly. So okay. that he has the liberty to pull this off. But then I remember every time he would branch off into that thought process, he would come back and tell me, but it's a story of our land. It's a story of, of Malayalam. How, how am I supposed to say this in another language? Um, in a way, I'm thankful that finally uh, we got to 2018 for the film to start rolling. Because in those 10 years, uh, a lot of things changed for cinema in general and especially for Malayalam cinema. So by the time it was 2018, the industry dynamics had evolved to a point where although it still remained a very big challenge, we could now start thinking of something like this. We could now hope to be able to make this and maybe even hope to make the money back, which we still don't know. Uh, so yeah, it, it took us a good 10 years to finally reach a point where we could start shooting start filming and we thought that was the end of the struggle we thought now yeah everything is in place we just start filming and we finish filming and we had this beautiful plan in place where we would uh, so I 
for the beginning portions of the film, I put on a lot of weight. Uh, you will also, as much as you will see the thinnest me in the film, you will also probably see the fattest me ever in the film. Uh, so I, I put on a lot of weight and we did our Kerala schedule, uh, which was a breeze. It was just a joy to be shooting. Everything went like clockwork. Then we went to Jordan to do the, uh, in the beginning of 2019, we went to Jordan and we did what we now very impolitely refer to as a fat desert schedule and uh, we wrapped we wrapped up and we were like all gung ho and uh, bless you was like how long do you need to uh, uh, lose weight so i said 6 months so i said i'll give you 8 months so i'm like then i'm going to shock you with what i'm going to be doing and uh, in fact i shocked myself i <laughs> i ended up i ended up losing 31 kilos uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know it was possible actually. Uh, I was 98 kilos when we wrapped the fat desert schedule and I came down to 67 kilos when we shot that, that portions where my body needs to be seen. Uh, and everybody was so like you know and I remember I land up in, in Jordan for the slim desert schedule and the whole unit was kind of shocked. Uh, looking at me. So, I, I remember I called Blessy to my tent and uh, I took off my t-shirt and I'm like, now it's up to you. Huh? Uh, so, so he was so happy and we started shooting and then the pandemic yeah. happened. Yeah. The pandemic happened and uh, we didn't bother with the pandemic actually till the Jordanian police stepped in and said, we are sorry, we can't let you film any longer. And uh, that is when it's, it hit us that we might have to stop, shoot and go back with absolutely no idea when we can come back or if we can ever come back or if we can ever complete the film. And the last day of leaving Jordan after having been stuck there for almost three months without shooting, uh, I remember this conversation with just Blessy and me. Uh, and Blessy walks up to me and tells me as we are about to leave to the airport, he said, you know, 10 years ago, it was just you and me. So, I just want that one moment between you and me. We'll get this done, right? And I'm like, yeah, of course we'll get this done. So, <laughs> and I didn't know because uh, the shoot was suspended for one and a half years, which meant that I had to go through the whole transformation process a second time. And though I was trying to paint a very confident picture with Blessy, I didn't know if I could do it. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even know if my body would respond a second time like that. But I guess this film was destined to be made this way. I, I actually again hit pretty much the same body weight. and we. You lost 30 kilos again? No, I, I didn't put back that, that much, much weight. That much, okay. Uh, I was very careful that one, one and a half years. So, when you see films like Janaganamana and all that, you'll see a very frail looking me. Uh, for the for the advocate portions that is that was shot in between these two schedules uh, so I like say for example a film called Tirpa you will see like a very thin me that's me being very careful not to let go because I am in the back of my mind I am thinking oh I need to get back to being Najib uh, then finally the world opened up and we went to Algeria to a place called Timimoon deep into the, into the Sahara Desert. I don't know if any film crews ever made it there. It's like one corner of the world. And we shot the entire escape portion in Algeria, in the Sahara Desert. Then we came back to Jordan and we finished what we could not finish in 2020. 20, uh, 20. Then we came back to Kerala where we put up uh, a prison set and we finally wrapped the film in 2022 about, you know, uh, yeah, like more than a decade after having first thought of doing the film. And then it's a year, year and a half long post production schedule and uh, here we are today talking about the release. So, when I first said yes to the film, I wasn't married. I was obviously not a father. I had not turned producer. I had not turned director. I had not yet become distributor. And I was just a different human being. So, for 16 years I've traveled with this one film. I'm 41 years old, which means a significant part of my life and a more than significant part of my adult life, uh, there's been just one constant and that is this film. So come the 28th of this month, a lot of things culminate, amongst which one is a film. So That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> so, 
when, and obviously, this is not to compare struggles, right? What you guys went through and what Najib went through is, yeah. is two very different things. But when you're making a story of struggle and there is so much struggle in it, does it shape the storytelling? Uh, so, one thing I'm very, very proud of and secretly very much in awe of uh, with regards to Blessy is that this whole, you know, little speech that I gave you about how this film was made, all through that process, with all these obstacles and challenges that we had to face, I can guarantee that there is not a single moment of compromise in this film. Like there's not been one shot in the entire film that any crew member has thought, that's ah, okay, we'll let that go. It's never been that way. There have been days when we have not been able to capture a single shot. Uh, there have been days when we wanted that one shot and we would try for the whole day and then just get that one shot. Uh, so one of the most important things when you're filming with natural light in, in the desert with that topography is to maintain a light continuity and firstly have a plan as to what time of the day should each scene be happening. So if there's a particular scene that you think in the narrative fits in at sunrise, the actual sunrise light in the desert is about 25 minutes long. Yeah. After that, it just becomes bright, too bright to be filming it as early morning. And in 25 minutes, even if you are very well prepared and very well planned, maybe you get a shot, two shots. So if there's a sunrise scene that you see in the film, it would have been filmed across 30 mornings. You wow. know? And if there is a, a sunset scene in the film, it would have been filmed across 25 evenings. And if there is like a scene where you needed the sun right on top of your head with the light casting a shadow on your face, underneath the eye, it would have been shot exactly between 12 and 2 across 25 days. So that kind of attention to detail, that kind of conviction, and this is not Especially for Malayalam cinema, this is not a cheap endeavor. It's a very, very expensive film to make. Uh, we were there with a proper full-sized crew, uh, you know, and uh, we had already spent a lot of money, uh, which unfortunately is not even going to be seen on screen. You know, money that went towards holding the entire team in Jordan for three months um, through the pandemic. And even then, you know, even then, not for a single day, not for a single moment did we think, Maybe we should just let go. Maybe we should just take the easy way out. So I don't know how many actors would have had the privilege of living through a journey like this. Uh, I, I don't know if I'll ever get another opportunity to do one more film uh, following the same process that I could for this film. So it's just been a huge privilege. And uh, I, I am a changed man for the process of having made this film, I think. I was just going to say yeah. that you can't come away from an experience like this no. untouched, no. right? And you're, of course, actor, director, producer, distributor. What is the one thing that you might do now or might not do now because you've been through this journey? Well, for one, I'd probably not make a desert film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Never yeah. going back into sand again. I mean, so, yeah, it's, it's funny because uh, about, about a month, I think a month ago, a couple of months back, I get a call from Ali saying, listen, we need to uh, shoot your introduction scene for this film called Badenia Chotemia. This is Ali Abbas Zafar. Yeah, Ali Abbas Zafar, sorry. So I'm like, okay, um, so where are we shooting this? So he's like, there's this place called Akaba in Jordan. I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, really? Is there a place? And uh, like, yeah, it's very beautiful. I said, hmm, okay. <laughs> so I land up. Uh, and the team is waiting to receive me at Amman Airport. And from the moment I step off the Aero Bridge, the airport staff is like, Hi, hello. <laughs> and the whole Badenia Chotenia team is going, ah, what? So I'm like, you know, I'm almost citizen here. So, <laughs> yeah, so I did go back. I did go back very recently. Uh, but it's just, you know, I mean, it's, uh, it, it sort of taught me. Blessy, the filmmaker, sort of taught me how much can you, how much of yourself can you invest towards a dream, you know, uh, especially in cinema. 
uh, if there are Malayalis in the in, in, in this uh, in the gathering. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> there are. I see. So, so uh, even back in 2009, when Blessy first came to me, he was one of Malayalam cinema's most coveted filmmakers. And to my knowledge, back in 2009, Blessy was the highest-paid filmmaker in Malayalam. And he could walk up to any star, any actor, and tell them that he wants to do a film. They would immediately say yes. All of us wanted to tick off that one Blessy film at least in our careers. And he decides that he's going to just give 16 years to one film, you know. Uh, that kind of commitment, that kind of conviction towards creating something that you want to, that's a lesson that I will always keep as a bank inside of me. And that's, I don't think that's just a lesson for cinema, that's a life lesson. Yeah. Uh, so every time people start talking about my weight loss, my commitment for this film, I'm like, hold your horses. That is nothing mm -hmm. compared to what Blessy has done. I mean, that man, by through these many years, could have done so many films. He might have, you know, just gone off on a completely different trajectory. Maybe by now he would have been making world-class cinema somewhere outside of India. Mm -hmm. But look at him, he decided that this is what I want to do. So that is uh, something I'll always cherish. And uh, the memories of, of seeing this filmmaker just holding on to that and not letting he, he, go. You never saw him break? He never had a moment of just, you know? The last day of shoot in, in Jordan, the second time we went, the last day of shoot. So he finally says cut and wrap. And obviously, like everybody, there are people beginning to cry. There are people, and Blessy is just stone faced. And uh, I'm like, so he's like, you know, so he starts telling me, no, you know, we have, uh, we have to go back and shoot the prison portions in, in in Kerala and all that. I'm like, yeah, but, and slowly he's his speech starts slurring. No, he wasn't drunk, uh, <laughs> and he starts becoming disoriented. And it in about, and I'm not talking about overnight or something, I'm talking about like in, in about 20 minutes post the last shot, he's no longer able to speak, he's no, he's no longer able to stand and we took him to a hospital and he was in a hospital in uh, um, Amman, no, in Akaba for two days and uh, on the flight back, so he was uh, actually supposed to fly on a different flight. I changed his flight and put him on the same flight as I was flying. And my wife had joined me because this monumental film is coming to an end just for the last day of shoot. So he was on a wheelchair and Supriya was the one who pushed the wheels. My wife was the one who pushed the, pushed the wheelchair and he was in the lounge waiting for the flight to take off. And I told him to eat something and I got him some food from the buffet at the lounge. And he could not eat. Apparently his sodium levels had dropped or something had happened and he had, he came straight back and from the airport he went straight to the hospital and he was in a hospital in Kotem for 20 days. My God. Uh, and I had never seen that man, you know, so weak, yeah. so sick. Uh, you should see photographs of Blessy from the first day of shoot of RDG with him and now. They look like father and son. <laughs> really? I don't, I mean, they actually look like father and son. Blessy today looks like Santa Claus. There's no, there's not one black hair yeah. on his head or his chin. Back in 2018, he was a different man. So that is the kind of investment he has made as, as a human being towards this film. It is just incredible. That is incredible. Yeah. My God. talk a little bit about um, the adaptation and, and whatever perspective you had on it. So I saw this lovely, uh, there was an interview with Benjamin who wrote the novel yeah. um, and he used this lovely metaphor for books into film. He said that the relationship between literature and cinema is like water and vapor. Uh, when you see water, uh, when you see vapor, you know there's water in it, but you don't know how much. Yeah. So the vapor is the film. Yeah. And the water is the literature. Yes. So you don't know how much it's taken, but obviously the essence is the same. What is your sense of how much of the book is in the film? So, obviously before being a book, this was a life that was lived. 
this was a life that was lived by someone who actually fought through and survived and got through to the other end of this experience to be able to come and narrate his tale. So, a life was then documented into literature. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that are not in the book yeah. that Najib felt or Najib has seen, Najib has uh, gone through. But the thing with documenting through words is that you have the liberty of micro detailing. Like a single moment in someone's life could be 25 pages, right? You can micro detail, you can dwell on each moment. So if you were to make a feature film out of the entire book that Benjamin has written, it would at the very least be a 10 hour long film. Mm. So at the very outset we knew that was not going to be possible. And Another thing that it's, that's not going to be possible at all is to be challenging the reader's imagination. Uh, it's one of the largest selling books in the history of Malayalam literature in Kerala. It's been translated speak, into several languages. Yes, it? as yeah. we speak, I think it's already on its 251st edition or something. Yeah. So if we were to go out there and challenge the reader's imagination, I think we would fail. Uh, even if our conception of the whole thing is superior, we would still fail because we will probably be uh, going against the grain of what a reader envisioned while reading. So Blessy had this wonderful take on the whole process that he told me what we should be attempting is to try and make the audience feel what Najib might have felt. Forget the incident chronology, forget the incident detailing, forget all that. Try and take them through that emotional graph. So how do you design an emotional graph for a life experience like this? How do you design an arc for the performance for a life experience like this? As an actor, I also realize that it is going to be next to impossible for me to look at it as one big character arc from beginning to end because it's just too complex. There are too many things involved. So we landed on this idea that the narration of the film, much like the character arc in terms of a performance, uh, will be divided into three stages. So there is of course a bit of information about who he was, what he did back home before leaving for the desert, what did he leave behind, his family. All that information will come to you as snippets of flashbacks in between the narrative in the first half. And it's beautiful because all those snippets are very wet and moist in the literal sense because it all happens with water all around. Yes. Najib used to be a, a free diving sand miner who used to dive into the depths of the river and mine sand. So his world was under underwater. He lived in a, in a, in a topography that had a lot of rain. Mm. So all these snippets that you show as his memories are all very wet and he is in a very arid, dry land. Uh, so that... The, bit of the information is there. But once he lands up in the desert, we decided that we will have three phases. One is where he initially reaches the desert and he understands, realizes that he's stuck. And the immediate reaction is that of denial. That no, this is a mistake. This can't be happening. Uh, he's trying to convince in whatever language he can, the people around him that no, no, this is a mistake. I need to go back. I need to escape. So it's a, a phase of denial and the narrative breaks at one particular point. Then you see him a few months later. A few months later you meet him, he's lost a bit of weight, his beard has grown, his hair has grown and it is the second phase of the narrative, the second phase of the performance arc where he's angry. He's angry at everything. He's angry at his predicament, he's angry at the decision he made. He's angry at God, so it's anger. So the filming, the writing, the performance is all based on anger. And the narrative breaks again. And then you meet him three years later, where now he's a different person altogether. He is now part man, part animal. Because for three years, he's only spoken to animals. He's only interacted with animals. Uh, and as a human being, he's now almost at a spiritual plane where he's come to terms with the fact that regardless of how, how long this lasts, this will last, this is an experience that I will have to live through. And I will have to live through this and see what is on the other side. 
The other side could be death, could be escape, could be salvation, but I will just have to live through this. And you see this man who is now come to terms with the fact that this is a phase, a life that I will just have to live through. And the filming is such, the writing is such, and the performance arc is such. So it was these three phases that we decided we will take the narrative through. And I think what is very beautiful about the way Blessy has conceived the film is that each time you break the narrative and you meet this man in the next phase, it's almost like without showing you anything, without telling you anything, you almost know what happened between these two phases. Right. You, know? you, you fill in the gaps. Yeah, you almost n feel what happened between these two phases. So it's a, it's a complex character arc. It's a very complex film to make. And I'm, I'm glad I got the opportunity to do it. So Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, there's this um, lovely video. I don't know how many of you guys have seen it on, on YouTube uh, about the time when all of you were stuck in Jordan, yeah. right? And at the end of it, Plessy says, and it's very moving, that you all live together like brothers. Yeah. And he says, without worrying about who was what religion or what caste or, you know, he said that something like compassion yeah. is what saw you all through. Um, and, you know, you watch that and it, it brings tears to your eyes to just see like how at that moment, everyone put their best self forward. Yeah. What is your most enduring memory of those months? You know, so, um, uh, so I'm at a stage in my career where when I do a film now, I'm uh, like looked upon as one of the decision makers, like one of the leaders on set. So especially when you're dealt with a situation like the team of RDG with them was, uh, the, the crew, the team will look up to you uh, to, to make decisions, yeah. to, to let them know that it's all right. So we used to have these uh, crew meetings almost every day in this big mess hall that we had in the desert camp. And we'd just talk to everyone, tell them, no, don't worry, it's all right, uh, you know, we'll, we'll eventually be able to go back home. And contrary to popular narrative that existed back then, we weren't exactly starving, you know. We, yes. We were in a beautiful part of the world, in a nice desert camp with lots of food, playing cricket and all that. But this uh, growing feeling about uh, when can we return home was there. But it took me about four or five of these crew meetings to realize that the meeting was actually not about me comforting the others. It was the other way around. Because I had gone through this huge physical transformation. I was not eating. Since we did not know if we would get the shoot permission suddenly one day, I was still holding on to the diet. Everyone from the director to the production boy, I realized was trying to tell me in their own fashion, don't worry, you know, don't worry, it'll, 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 we understand what you're going through. Nobody would eat in front of me. Like, <laughs> yeah. like if I, so I realized it's like during lunch time, when I walked into the mess hall, everybody would be like, <laughs> so then I, I used to then make sure that I would never go to eat whatever little food I was eating when they were there because they used to feel bad because they were like dabawing biryani and all that. So, so it was just, that is compassion, right? I mean, that is compassion. Not once, the, not once did, did someone come up to me and ask me, when can we go back? All, all the questions were about when can we start shoot? When do you think we can start shooting again? When do you think we can, we can get this done? So, and I realized everyone had a sense of ownership uh, for the, of the film. And that's just a wonderful, wonderful, uh, you know, work culture to be in. Hats off to the crew, uh, hats off to the team. It was not the easiest of films to make, but the kind, so, and see, I am now experienced enough uh, in this field to, anticipate and understand that I am the one who's going to be coming and doing the front row with Anupama Chopra, not the production boy, no, not, not the light boys. Uh, you will maybe read a few names at the end scrolling titles, but they shared the same experience with me. You know, uh, it's not that I had some special thing, I'm the actor so I get the limelight, but they shared the same experience with me. They went through the same thing with me. So it's just uh, that sense of brotherhood 
was really really there and uh, i i i owe this film and this performance to each one of them yeah. you know there's also that moment in the video where mohanlal sir calls yeah. and he's on speaker yeah right and it's so moving because he's just saying to bless you sir that look after everyone yeah. you know and there's such a sense of community yeah that you're not alone right and i felt that same thing so a couple of weeks ago i went to see manumal boys yeah and uh, amazing amazing sir and prithvi the the thanks in the opening credits just keeps going for minutes is like yeah. thank you thank you thank you like half of the malayalam film industry has been thanked in that film and again i come away thinking what a sense of community what a camaraderie between artists how do you do it because we don't have it here really <laughs> no we don't i'm not lying we don't i think we are evolved enough to understand that anybody's success is everybody's success so manumal boys or premalu for that matter or bramayugam i'm just talking about <laughs> What a year! Yeah. What a year for Malayalam cinema. It's only March. I'm just talking about <laughs> three recent releases. So three films come and they do really, really well. And I just don't mean in terms of box office numbers. There's a lot of conversation around these three films. I, for one, know that I am benefiting from it. Why is there a sudden spike in interest in the goat life from the next big Malayalam release? I owe that to Manjimal Boys, to Premalu, to Brahma Yugam. i know their success could potentially pave the way for my success so make no mistake is very selfish that way you know <laughs> we know in the industry that if if a team will get together and make a cracking film everyone will benefit from it uh, so uh, and we pull a lot of favors while doing a film you know we i we genuinely do in which is the reason in malayalam cinema you see these 5 minute long thanks cards because there's a lot of favors being pulled uh without which we won't be able to do our cinema you know so uh, i think it's it's partly ingrained in the film culture because we started off as a very small compact industry where everyone knew everyone and that work culture still exists although now we are much bigger we thankfully have a lot more money to make films now but that culture still exists there you know we are all brothers we are all working for the same industry and uh, you know like say for example manumal boys uh there is a character in that played by jean who directed driving license uh, one of my big hits uh, the other character khalid rahman uh, i'm my, i'm doing a film with him he's directing a film with me uh, and uh, so the director of the film chidambaram his brother is ganpati he's a wonderful actor i've i've acted with him uh, sobin of course uh, was the third assistant director for anwar uh, with when i did that film with amal neerad so these are all people who and khalid rahman again was the associate director for saptamashri taskaraha and another film i did and i remember telling my co producer man this guy is really brilliant make sure we produce his first film and that's how anurag karigan vellam happened uh, khalid's wow. debut film so it's it's all you know one big process yeah. and uh, I, th- i i my my prayer and my hope is that malayalam cinema never lose a touch of that work culture yeah you know i want to learn malayalam to interview sobin <laughs> <laughs> i only know one word mansalaya he he <laughs> he can converse in english he is just shying away from it he, really yeah 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 he so can. you put in a word for me yeah <laughs> <laughs> so but but which as you also said last year you were you said in an interview that you're worried that this spotlight on malayalam cinema yeah. and the money might sort of little bit you know rock yeah. the boat in a bad way yeah what do you think might happen so i think a lot of our creativity um uh, stemmed from deprivation uh you know a lot of uh, malayalam cinema has been say to just quote one faculty okay i'm just going to take one craft and quote an example we have traditionally had fantastic cinematographers yeah. right i mean some of the biggest names in indian cinema cinematographers wise uh, have debuted in malayalam and have started out from malayalam why why is that 
because we shoot in real locations. And why do we shoot in real locations? Because traditionally, we couldn't afford sets. Uh, and traditionally, we couldn't afford large lighting setups and multiple generators on location. So we had to wait for proper light. We had to study proper light. Our cinematographers needed to use natural light and create latitude on film stock. So there was a culture where cinematography was very theoretically imparted, uh, which is the reason I think a lot of great cinematographers have their best work in Malayalam. Uh, it's just one craft I'm talking about. We no longer have the burden of thinking, oh, we can't put up a set. I mean, I'm just directing a film now, which is like, there are a lot of sets, right? And there are like six generators on my location. I have five cameras on location. So I'm also responsible. I just hope that this newfound liberty uh, that comes largely with the money that is available uh, does, does not take us away from our primary craft of telling a story in its most organic fashion, uh, which is what we were very good at and which is what we are still very good at. Uh, a Manumel Boys is shot in a set. Uh, the Guna Caves is, is a set, but it is still narrated in a very organic fashion. It does not feel synthetic. And it is not just the quality of the production design that does that. It is also the quality of the storytelling. So yeah. that's what I hope that we don't lose because suddenly we have all this available with us. You know? yeah. yeah, money can make you lazy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk about Salar just for a brief moment. Yeah. I really enjoyed your performance. Thank you so much. And I, um, I said in my review that it's so wonderful that a star as big as Prithviraj isn't squeamish about supporting Prabhas in the narrative. And I think Prashant Neel said in some interview that no other actor in the country would have done it. Okay. Hmm. So here's my question. Here's my question. Why aren't you squeamish? Are you that rare thing, a very secure actor? So, uh, I guess for people who are not aware of my entire body of work, Salar might be a surprise. But I have done a Talapav, an Achanuranga Tavid, I have, you know, uh, I have played the villain in a film called Kuridi. I uh, have never really, again, it comes, I'll tell you why, it, it comes from a very selfish uh, way of thinking about it. I have learned the hard way that it's always better to play the unremarkable character in a great film than to play that standout character in a bad film. Because characters do not live long, films do. Uh, so it comes from the thought process that as an actor or as a star, if you can identify the best possible way in which you can lend yourself to the film, do that. You know, uh, And actually it also comes from looking at a rich heritage we have, starting from Satin Mash. You know, uh, if, if you are aware of the history of Malayalam cinema, the biggest stars have done the most adventurous things traditionally in our industry. So, so yeah, I mean, uh, I guess it's, it's part culture, part heritage, part understanding cinema and an underlying love for facilitating good content. Yeah, yeah I mean, look at what Mamuti sir is doing right now. Yeah, yeah. It's just incredible. <laughs> I mean, um, first to see him in Kata Lakor and then see him in Brahma Yugam, I, I, I was like, I've never been afraid of an actor's teeth before. <laughs> you know? But that's what he did in Brahma Yugam. So during the, uh, during the lockdown, uh, is when, so uh, that time Mamuti sir, Dulka, Shanu, uh, Fahad, we were all in Kochi, we all live kind of in, in a circumference of about five kilometers. Uh, so, and we were not shooting. We were all home doing nothing. So at that time, we used to sort of meet up regularly. And uh, Mamudisa Suluanti has, makes this wonderful food. So we used to go to have lunch at, at his place, you know, uh, weekends. So after having met him regularly for a couple of times, I realized that the man is now entering a phase where he is thinking, and it's been a long time, I want to have fun now, you know. <laughs> And I, and I thought, wow, we are in for a treat. Yeah. And that is a message I said on a 
on a birthday video that I sent Mamuka that I think the most interesting phase of your career is about to start because I sensed that Mamuka has suddenly decided and I think the lockdown, the pandemic, everything sort of contributed towards that decision making where he is thinking it's been a long time, I don't know how much longer, so let me just have fun. And boy, are we not having fun because he's <laughs> having fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm going to open it up to the house in just a few minutes. Tell me, the amazing thing is that after Goat Life, two weeks after Goat Life, you're back with Bade Mia, Chote Mia. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's incredible. The range of this cinema is amazing. Yeah, so I, I actually keep joking that, you know, it's, it's, in a way it's, it's great as a PR exercise uh, for myself <laughs> that uh, these two films are coming so close to each other because the characters are so diametrically opposite. If uh, I had to sort of do like a two film resume of who I am as an actor, this could be quite good actually. Um, and Bade Mia Chote Mia is a film that I had a lot of fun with because it's, I mean, I don't get offered villain roles very often, you know. Uh, um, and when Ali called me and he offered me this film, the thing with franchise films, right, I mean, but the, the idea behind Bade Mia Chote Mia is to make it into a franchise. The thing with franchise films, James Bond, Mission Impossible, anything, the stories are villains, the heroes do the same thing, yeah. James Bond does the same thing, the stories are villains. So yeah, I mean, I'm the one having fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, and before we open it up, what can you tell us about Empura? Yeah, that's just one of those another commercial films. <laughs> <laughs> Not letting you go with that. Kuch to something. No, I mean it's uh. When you start, like, okay, where are you in the shoot process? You're just going to begin? No, no, no. I have. Uh, so I have. Uh, what is not fully in my control. Uh, the locations that we've had to shoot in outside of India because there are multiple factors into play here like uh, government permissions from local councils in other countries, weather, climate. So I was very keen that I need to finish those portions off first, which I have. So the only other overseas schedule remaining is uh, the UAE, which now I think I'll do post summer. So I finished my portions in the UK and I finished the portions I needed to shoot in the US and now I have portions remaining in India. So maybe I've shot about 20% of the film. Uh, but I mean, I don't even know if the film I'm making is the sequel that people expect of, uh, of Lucifer. Uh, you are not going to see Mohanlal wind up his mundu and beat up people in a closed down factory. Okay. That, that, that is not what I am making. So yeah, let's see. <laughs> Can we just put in one of those? Maybe I'll do maybe I'll do one of maybe I'll do one of those Bollywoodish uh, end title songs. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Come on, yeah. you have to let us also give you something. <laughs> it's not yeah. a bad idea at all. Uh, one last question. So the very last day of Goat Life, yeah. which is when you came back, you did the prison sequence in in yes. Kenya. Yeah? Yes. When you finished that last shot, what did both of you say to each other? Bless you. He cried for I think a long time. Uh, that that day the reaction was normal actually, so I was relieved uh, because he was in the hospital. He you know uh, he got better. Then we were shooting. And that day he cried and the reaction was normal, which is what I expected him to do. Uh, but even more special was that the first time I spoke to the real Najib is that day. Really? Yes. So Najib was always accessible. He is obviously a very good friend of Benjamin, the writer, and a good friend of Blessy, the director. And I could have spoken to him, met him any day, any time, any number of times. But Blessy and me decided that we'll keep it another way, that I create my own interpretation of what and who Najib is from what Blessy has written on paper. 
and last day after we had so we invited Najib to the location uh, for the last day's shoot. Last day after I gave the last shot is when I walked behind the camera and I spoke to Najib for the first time. And we have in fact recorded that conversation. We have filmed that conversation and I hope it'll it'll come out sometime. Yeah. Did you cry? I think I hid the fact that I was crying. So <laughs> yeah. I mean I was I, I was obviously expected to act cool and uh, but I mean, it's just a, a momentous occasion and yeah. the sense that uh, so a, a lot of the people who are now associated with the film might have a story about five years to tell you, maybe six years to tell you. Uh, Rahman sir was one of the first people who came on board. So maybe he could tell you a story about seven years, but bless you and me, you know, <laughs> we have a story about 16 years. So yeah, for, for the both of us, it was a momentous occasion. But I actually don't think there is ever going to be like a final farewell to RDZ with them and Najib. It is so strange because when you live with the process of ideating for a film and a character for this long, it could be the most random moments. Like I could be, I could be shooting in Portugal for some other film completely not connected to this. And one day I could just suddenly zone out and be thinking of Najib, you know, be thinking of, oh, so then what would he have thought of when that happened? I am assuming that is still going to happen five years after the film is released. I don't think my brain will be wired to stop that just because the film has released. I don't think my brain will tell me, oh, the film has now released, now we can stop. I don't think that's going to happen. I'm sure 2031, if I'm still alive and well, I'll be somewhere and suddenly I'll zone out into thinking, oh, so what would Najib have, Najib have been doing then? So that will keep happening. So I'm thinking there is never going to be a final farewell to Najib and the goat life for me. How lovely. Yeah. How lovely. Thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, we'll open it up to the audience. Firstly, um, ma'am, good evening. Uh, good evening, Prithvi Raj, welcome good to evening. Mumbai. Um, my question to you is, I remember back uh, during the film Companion Roundtable in 22, when you yeah. invited over for Janagana Mana, you had said, that you want to do for Malayalam cinema what Rajamouli sir has done for the Telugu cinema. Yeah. So when you do a Salar and now when you're doing a Bade Mia Chote Mia, which actually marks your uh, return to Hindi cinema after a very, very long gap, um, is that your effort of walking the talk? People tend to associate what Rajamouli sir did for Telugu cinema with just the bah Bahubali franchise. My take is that it's way more than that, you know. It's not the film that he did. It's what he told all of us is possible. Much like Prashant, you know, uh, us Malayalis used to think the Kannada film industry was smaller than ours. We thought we were a bigger industry. We thought we had uh, more volume of work, more revenue, more money. And then this man comes and does this and, you know, suddenly creates this uh, worldwide phenomenon. So I would love to do something or be part of something that tells all this wonderfully, all these wonderfully talented filmmakers and actors and producers that we have in Malayalam that it is okay to dream big. But I think that phenomenon is already happening. You know, it's already happening. Uh, not, you don't have to like go back long way. Five years ago, do you think it would have been possible for a Malayalam film like Ardu Jeevitham to be released by Red Giant in Tamil Nadu, to be released by Maitri in Andhra Telangana, by Hombale in Karnataka, by Anil Tadhani in the North Circuit? When did, we, when did that ever happen to Malayalam cinema? And it's happening. And it, all it took was one phone call. It's just one phone call each that I made to Anil, to Ravi of Maitri. Uh, I called uh, Uday. I, Hombaleto is of course like an associate of mine. But it is telling us that it is okay now to dream bigger. And when I say bigger, it's not bigger budgets, it's not bigger films. It's okay to now dream that our films can travel, that our films can be showcased across the world. Uh, a Manumel boy is doing a 175 crores, make no mistake, it is not a one time phenomenon. It will happen again. When Grishin, <laughs> when, 
when Drishim did 50 crores for the first time, we thought that was a freak accident. We didn't think Malayalam cinema could make that kind of money. And very soon Premam happened. Then Ennuninda Moidin happened. Then when Pulimurgan did 100 crores, we thought that is it. I mean, this is the glass ceiling. Then Lucifer happened. And then we thought, okay, I mean, that's it, no more. Then a 2018 happens. And we're like, okay, now that's. You know. Then Manjumel voice come across. And then Premalu. So, yeah, it was just. We are getting there, you know, we are getting to the point where world over Malayalam cinema will be showcased. Non-Malayali audience will want to watch our cinema in our language. Uh, so that's the dream I want to be part of. Uh, and uh, for me at least, I might be wrong, uh, of all the mainstream filmmakers, modern mainstream filmmakers, uh, the one man who showed us the way is Rajamouli sir. Uh, hi Rajata. Hello. Uh, hi Anupama ma'am. I'm hi everybody. I'm very happy I'm here today because I just came from Kochi just for the session. Oh, I also came from Kochi. <laughs> uh, so one thing I wanted to ask you is just like you said, uh, how the screenplay of the film is staged in three layers. Yeah. Uh, I was patiently waiting for the film, but then at some point I lost, lost my patience and I read the book okay. very recently. And uh, from then I've been visualizing like how it, it would be. And once the trailer came out, uh, it just blew my mind. So uh, one thing I'm very curious to know is uh, the portion where uh, in the book I feel um, Najib's and Sainu's love is not very deeply visited. It's, yeah. it's a it's a it's mentioned but then it's not very deeply visited but then when the trailer came in and when the songs have been coming in we are seeing a lot more uh, of that so uh, according to you how far the boundaries of what benjamin has written has been stretched in rdg vidam in this version wonderful question actually so that's that's the thing about translating literature onto the screen right what could what might have been 40 pages in the book could be 3 seconds in cinema. What could have been two sentences in a book could be 25 minutes in a film. So that's the thing, that's what we have to be aware of when you're translating literature. This exercise is also something that we do generally when we write uh, screenplays out of stories. So when we do cinema, of course, we first, you know, we have a story in mind, then we want to have a, uh, an event flow in mind. Then finally, when we start writing the screenplay, this is something we keep in mind while that exercise happens. Uh, the love story part of it has got a lot of blessing. Okay, got a lot of blessing because Blessedness is very much Bharadan Padmarajan in the love story angle of it. Uh, he is from that school, you know, he was Padmarajan sir's associate director. But one of the most evocative things about Najib's story for me is that when he left, Sainu, his wife, was two months pregnant. And then he is not even able to make a phone call for the next three years. Three years later, there is a moment in the film, my favorite moment actually, uh, in the film where three years later, when finally he is found and he manages to get access to a phone and they call a local uh, booth next to Najib's house and, uh, and Sainu is there uh, and he, she gets the phone. He takes the phone and he does not know what to say. And he hears a baby crying. And this guy, man just breaks down, you know. That is one of the most evocative moments for me in the film. Like, he is about to say hello and he hears the baby crying. And he realizes this is the baby that his wife was carrying in her womb when he left. So that is how much of a motivation Sainu and the love story is for him to have made it through that experience. There are moments even in the film when Najib contemplates taking his own life. And there are these small things that makes him hang on to life, like this jar of pickle that his mother had sent. And he saves it. He saves that one last mango, kanni uh, manga, you know, I don't know what, yeah. I don't know what the English equivalent is, yeah. Uh, that one last mango, he saves it. And he eats that 
only when he finally decides to escape. The day he leaves the Masara, he eats that one final mango that he saved for three years and he runs. And there are just so many evocative moments. And there's this moment in the film where, <clears throat> and actually this is something I, I did in the shot without even knowing that I was going to do it. Because it's a, it's a shot where, a, it's, it's a steady cam shot and the camera is running with me. So he starts running from the Masara and he runs for about 100, 120 meters and he stops and he turns and looks at all the animals, you know. And he's like, he suddenly realizes he might be going back home, but he's leaving home as well. So there are these so many evocative moments in the narrative. And then to think that all this was lived by one man, the greatest compliment I got is when Najib saw the footage. And he's not, he's usually not very articulate. He, you know, doesn't speak a lot. And he was crying and all he was saying is, Ella orma on the way, sare, Ella orma, which means everything just came rushing back. Everything just came rushing back. It's the greatest compliment for me, you know. And <laughs> Thank you for what you're doing for Malayalam cinema. You're okay. an inspiration. <laughs> Hello, Rajweta. Hello. Uh, my name is Arun Nair. Hi. I just came all the way to just just to see you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and it's still unbe unbelievable that you're sitting in front of me. <laughs> well, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Th uh, thank you for Lucifer and keeping excited for Emburan as well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, sir, when you, were act uh, when you were acting, what was the conversation between you and Blessy, sir? Means backing up the team, motivating the team. Every day we have to go through something. As you said earlier that yeah. you took only a single shot waiting for, that su waiting for the sunlight. Yeah. What was the conversation <clears throat> going around the team and you and the crew? How was they backing themselves? So, I think the, the energy that Blessy and me uh, shared going into the film when we started it in 2018 slowly became infectious and I think pretty much the whole crew got into that zone that no compromise, nothing. If we have to uh, be here for the next six months, we will, but we will not compromise. So that sort of became very infectious. Uh, and uh, even the way the film was shot is just so uh, liberating as an actor because there are so many scenes in the film where Blessy is told me, I am not going to say cut. When you feel you are done, you let wow. us know. Uh, and there is a, uh, so there are multiple scenes. So I remember one of the posters that, that, were in, in, uh, that was in, in the, the interview as a backdrop today had, had a still from one scene where I remember he had said the same thing that, uh, I'm not going to say cut. When you feel like you're done, you t let us know. So how do you feel that you're done? You know, <laughs> I didn't know how. So you get into that zone, you're in that moment and you, you, you might be feeling sad, frustrated, anger. Your frustration, your anger, your sorrow, that doesn't get over within the time span of a shot, right? So I was in that moment, I was just there, just being Najib. And I remember, I don't know, I don't quite recollect how long it was. I remember the cameraman slowly whispering, Which is Sunil, the cinematographer asking, can I cut? You know, so, so then I had forgotten that I was supposed to say, yeah, it's, it's done. So, yeah, it's, and it's just a wonderful way to make a film. It's such a luxury for an actor, you know, so, yeah. so funny. Yeah. Thank you, Prithvita. I love you a lot. Thank you. Love you too. Hi. Uh, I'm also Ma Malayali. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I was planning this question for Blessisa since he is not here. Yeah, I mean, you. he ditched me, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the perception of success will be different for different artists. So why do you think the ultimate success that this movie will make? It might not be in terms of the box office number or anything. So what do you think the success will be? Also, uh, you have been the part of this movie since the last 16 years. So. Why do you think the moment, there will be a moment that you will feel, okay, uh, these 16 years was worth for this moment. What that moment might be? The 16 years are already worth it. 
I can assure you, I mean, I, it's already worth it. Regardless of what happens on the 28th of March, I am a better person, definitely a better actor, uh, you know, uh, most likely a better father, about the husband part, I'm not sure, uh, <laughs> for having lived through this experience. So, the 16 years are definitely worth it. And uh, what is the ultimate gratification? Make no mistake, it is box office numbers. I am not apologetic about that at all. What, what do box office numbers mean? That people have come and seen your film. That's what you make the films for. Uh, you know, um, if I had to pick between a blockbuster and that award, I would always pick the blockbuster. Mm -hmm. Because that is what you make films for. We have made RDG with them for lakhs and lakhs of people to come to the theatre and watch it. And if RDG with them has great box office numbers, it means a lot of people have seen the film. So that is the ultimate gratification. The greatest glory the film can have is for people all around the world to discover Najib's life and to see what he lived through and to enjoy the cinematic narrative that we have created from his life and to walk away from the theatres with an experience of a lifetime. So yeah, that's what we are hoping for. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, hello, ma'am. Hello, sir. Hi. Uh, one, of the, one of the few non-Malayalis in the room. Okay. <laughs> But, uh, you yeah. and me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, what I wanted to ask you, sir, is that um, you have done a films of uh, like you know of all genres: comedy, love story, drama, action, and now a biopic. Uh, I wanted to ask you that as an actor, were you able to separate the real person from the character, or something like was it a sense of responsibility took over as an actor or something like that? What was your experience in this journey? So, I've had the privilege of doing uh, many films based on real life characters like Celluloid, uh, you know, uh, you, sorry? Yeah, Enun Inda uh, Mohideen, many films that I've, I've had the privilege of doing real life characters and I have realized over the years that you still have to treat it as a character. You still have to treat it as a character, but I'll tell you how it helped me, the hunger, you know. I was hungry while making this film because I wasn't eating. And uh, when, of course, when there was lunch break and the crew would be sitting inside the tents and eating and I'm just waiting there for them to finish and come so that I can, and I'd be hungry and I'd be hangry. Uh, and then suddenly it would strike me, man, he must have been hungry. You know, Najib must have been hungry and I am hungry by choice. Mm. If Najib had access to a buffet like that, he would go and eat, but he didn't. Then what am I complaining about? Shut up and suck it up, you know. <laughs> so that helped, that helped. But other than that, I think it is very important for an actor to treat it as a character because the process remains the same. Even if you are playing a fictional character or a real life character, the process remains the same. Now, I will tell you where it differs. Uh, when you do a 1983, when Ranveer played Kapil, I think he was very intelligent about it. Uh, I have seen remarks about uh, Ranveer's performance being an imitation in terms of his body language. I don't think there was any other way to play it. I think Ranveer did a brilliant job because we all know Kapil Dev sir. We all know how he speaks. We all know his bowling action. We all know how he bats. We all know the man. We all know how, what his hair looks like. So if Ranveer had decided to bring his own interpretation of who Kapil Dev is, it would have been a problem. Mm -hmm. So at, on instances like that, you need to be studying the person clinically and bring in an aspect of imitation into your performance. But not when you do someone like an Ajit. I'm sure we've been given a time out and yes, we have reached it. But you guys have all been a wonderful audience. Thank you. And thank you, Prithvi. Thank you. Thank you.